Amigas y amigos, dear friends, my name is Ignacio Peiro, and I am the director of Instituto Cervantes London. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this panel, The Oceans 500 Years Later, for which we have gathered two leading scholars in natural sciences, namely Dr. Iris Hendricks and Dr. Jack Middleburg. My first thanks goes to them and also to Chiara Sotis, who will chair the discussion this evening and who is a PhD candidate in environmental economics at the Department of Geography and Environment at the LSE. A big gracias, of course, goes to Fundación Iberdrola, Scottish Power as well, since it is the sponsorship that has made this event possible. And now that I've just mentioned the LSE, please let me show them my gratitude as well since today's event is a joint initiative launched by both the Instituto Cervantes and our friends from the Cañada Blanc Center at the LSE and the Fundación Cañada Blanc in Valencia, Spain. In particular, I want to thank um, his director, the, the uh, director of the Cañada Blanc Center at the LSE, Professor Andres Rodriguez Pose, for his support in what is a new installment of our Rethinking the World Today talk series. In this panel this evening, we would like to reflect on the evolution of our oceans, taking as a starting point the exploration age 500 years ago to make a comparison with the current conditions and the destruction the oceans have suffered since the times Spanish and Portuguese sailors like Elcano and Magellan made the discoveries. We will also consider the work of science and the value of understanding history as a weapon to be used in the conservation of our planet. Topics such as the threats to marine biodiversity will be discussed, including the adverse effects we see on health and in the changing climate due to the effects of human action on the environment. The importance of well-planned waste management will be considered as well, and the physical, chemical, biological, and geological effects that explain the current state of the oceans will be reviewed. Today's discussion will also highlight the tools available and the urgent need for crucial actions that must be taken, such as the creation of an adequate international network of marine reserves, which will allow future generations to enjoy the oceans much as we have been doing um, in this uh, half millennium. I will now leave the floor to Jana Etkin from Fundación Iberdrola, Scottish Power, but first, let me briefly introduce our speakers today. It is Hendrix has a degree in, in marine biology and a PhD in mathematics and natural sciences from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. She is currently based in Spain, where she is part of the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Studies, which, if I'm not mistaken, is based in Palma in Mallorca. And as for Jack Middelberg, he is the head of the Department of Geosciences and Earth Sciences at Utrecht University. In 2020, Middelberg has been uh, recognized as a member of the European Academy of Sciences. This is all for me, ladies and gentlemen. I will briefly um, come back in order to, 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 to leave the floor to the, skipper, to the speakers. I hope you will enjoy the panel and please feel free to take part uh, during the Q&A. Um, at the end of it, you can type your questions um, in the chat. Muchas gracias. Many thanks, Ignacio. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, here today to attend, uh, to tell you about the Iberdrola Foundation. Uh, my name is Jan Aitken. Um, I work for the Scottish Power Foundation, and I'm excited to tell you about our new Marine Biodiversity Fund, which we launched a few days ago, uh, a few days before COP. So Ibadrola is a global energy leader, the number one producer of wind power and one of the world's biggest electricity utilities. Our activities are mainly concentrated in five geographical areas, Spain, the United Kingdom, United States, Mexico and Brazil. From the Ibadrola group, we produce and supply electricity to around 100 million people worldwide. Since the Ibadrola Group was established, it's been committed to the energy, cultural and social development of the communities in which it operates. The work of the different foundations in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals is essential to fulfill this commitment. The Scottish Power Foundation was set up as a registered charity in 2013 
to demonstrate its own commitment to supporting its communities in the United Kingdom and is one of the five foundations within the Ibadrola Group. So what do we do at the Scottish Power Foundation? We provide funding each year to registered charities in the UK that support one of our strategic aims. The strategic aims are education, training and research, art and culture, social initiatives, and biodiversity and climate change. And in this category, it's about supporting the protection of the environment, increasing biodiversity, and actively contributing to the fight against climate change. We are very proud in the Scottish Power Foundation that since 2013, more than 200 projects across the UK have benefited from funding in grants totaling almost 10 million pounds. So you can see that climate and biodiversity were already one of the four strategic aims of the foundation. And given that the next decade of climate action will be crucial for the health of our seas and oceans, we were keen to do more in this field of marine biodiversity. And so we were delighted to receive an additional 400,000 in funding for a new marine biodiversity fund. This is the first multi-year fund for the foundation and the Scottish and Scottish Power have committed a further donation in 2022 meaning that we will be able to fund a marine biodiversity project for up to 600,000 over the next three years. We designed our criteria for this new fund following discussions and consultation with environmental experts within the Ibadrola business. And we were clear that the project should have two focuses. One, it should contribute to the protection and the enhancement of the marine environment, protecting uh, and enabling the repair of this environment. And the project should also share knowledge with other project partners within the local community and wider society to raise awareness of the threats to the marine and coastal environment. We received 16 applications for this new fund and a few trends stood out in the applications around national marine parks, citizen science, species protection, and restoration. But overwhelmingly, the trustees voted in support of one particular project that will drive a plan to simultaneously restore two marine species back in the Firth of Forth near Edinburgh in Scotland. The Scottish Power Foundation has awarded its first grant from the Marine Fund to WWF's Restoration Forth project. So what will Restoration Forth do for the marine environment? The project will work in partnership with scientists, charities and local communities to design a blueprint to restore and sustainably manage seagrass and oyster habitats in the Firth of Forth. Often described as the ocean's unsung hero, seagrass provides important habitat for marine life and is an incredible tool in the fight against climate change. Oyster reefs, which first flourished in the Forth many years ago, remove pollutants and provide a sanctuary for a vast array of marine life. The restoration of these two species will enhance the marine environment of the Forth, support nature-based solutions to address climate change, and create opportunities for local people to reconnect with the sea. Restoration Forth will put the community at the heart of its project with local people consulted throughout the project and a focus on developing skills and knowledge in the marine environment. A thriving marine environment is crucial if we are to tackle biodiversity and the climate crisis that we face. And this project will help us make a positive impact and create a climate legacy for many years to come. I would like to show you a very short video to explain more about the project. We're here today on the banks of the River Forth to launch a project called Restoration Forth, which the Scottish Power Foundation is funding from its Marine Biodiversity Fund. 
Restoration Forth is a multi-partner project. The main partner we're going to be working with is WWF and we're delighted to be working with them. But it's also going to involve a range of other community groups and local charities up and down the banks of the Forth. WWF is super excited about this project and really proud of what we can hopefully achieve here and so grateful to the Scottish Power Foundation for providing funding to kick it off. There's a lot of work that goes into this before we can get to the stage of getting oysters and seagrass out into the Firth of Forth. So we'll be working with uh, Harriet Watt and a range of specialists to grow up native oysters to the point where we can get them out into the sea. Um, and also working with Project Seagrass, who've developed a method for getting seagrass out there using these small hessian sacks where you put seeds in and essentially plant them out as if you're gardening within the sea. As trustees of the foundation, we get to look at lots of amazing projects, but we have to make quite hard decisions to think which ones will be the most important to support. In the run-up to COP26, it's amazing to be here on the Firth of Forth to support this project that's going to have a really significant impact both on uh, climate change, on the ecology and the restoration of this particular area and perhaps more importantly on the local communities who are going to be really heavily involved in the project. I'm immensely proud to be part of the Scottish Power Foundation and to have the opportunity to be able to fund projects like Restoration Forth. The climate emergency is on everybody's lips, particularly after lockdown, we're in our own localities, people are much more engaged in the, the conversation and it's brilliant for foundations like the Scottish Power Foundation to be able to fund the necessary research that we will all benefit from in our local environments going forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to come and tell you about the foundation and our work in the marine biodiversity space. I wish you a very informative and enjoyable evening. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you very much, Jan, for, for showing us the amazing work um, that the Scottish Power Foundation is undertaken, um, uh, is undertaken since 2013. And now, uh, without further ado, please, um, I will leave the floor now uh, to Chiara Sotis and, um, of course, um, Iris Hendricks and Jack Middleborough. And, uh, well, that's all from me. I do hope to that you enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio, and thank you to everyone who put together the event. I'm really excited to be a part of it. I think we're in for a very interesting evening where we'll talk about different topics throughout the talks from Iris and Professor Jack Middleburg. Um, they, they need no introduction. They're incredibly prolific scholars and they're writing a lot about climate change and how it's affecting our oceans. So they definitely don't need me to introduce them. Um, I'm looking forward to actually hearing them talk and to potentially have a discussion with them at the end. But I really invite you to make the most of this occasion to write questions and, and start the discussion yourselves so that we're only here to support it. And without further ado, I think Iris, you're our first speaker. So I'm going to leave the floor to you. Um, and then we're going to have Jack coming in and talking to us about the history of our oceans, the threats that it faces, and possibly the hopes for going on. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Ignacio. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to, well, be here in the virtual space to, to talk about this. I think it's um, a very important series, uh, the reflection um, of what is happening with the oceans. Um, so I'll see if I can uh, share my screen. So can you see the presentation at the moment? Yes, you can see the presentation in your notes series. Okay, so um, let me see if this is better. Is this better? Can you see the, the screen now and not the notes? No, we still see everything. Uh, that's funny. I don't know why. Um, okay, let me um, let me try that again. <laughs> okay, like <Perfect>. this. <laughs> okay, too much technology. Uh, okay, so sorry for that. Let me let me start without further ado. So um, when we think about the oceans 500 years ago, um, what did we know about the oceans? What we knew about the, the planet Earth is that it was, well, more or less the suspicion was that it was round and at the center of the universe. 
but the dimensions of the planet were unknown and navigation techniques, they were very crude still. So the picture I've shown here is an astrolabe, which is um, it's a mechanism in which you determine what, what latitude you're navigating. Uh, but it was very difficult for sailors to, um, to know where they were. So it was very precarious to, to actually go explore what was out there. So uh, that, the, that the planet was round was demonstrated by, by the first circumnavigation uh, expedition started by Fernando de Magalhães, who was uh, Portuguese, but actually sponsored by, by the Spanish crown. And uh, he wasn't able to finish the circumnavigation, but, uh, his, but Juan Sebastián Elcano was. And with this circumnavigation in the early 1500s, they, um, they demonstrated that the Earth was round. And uh, since the Earth is round, this offered a lot of uh, possibilities for actually for global trade uh, because it, it enhanced the connectivity between places. So, and with global trade um, again, and global com uh, commercialization, uh, commercial, commerce, uh, also came um, a little bit before the area, the era, which is also called the Colombian Exchange. It's an it's an era. Uh, a little bit more than 500 years ago, in which we um, humans started exploring the ocean and exploring uh, other sites and trading between um, the continents. So this is a is a map of the voyages of Christopher Columbus, sponsored by the Reyes Católicos, um, uh, a little more than 500 years ago, in, in which he undertook the journey from Europe to uh, the Americas for. Um, to discover and to trade. So with this trade, um, not only commercial goods and, um, and persons were transported, but also um, uh, marine animals. So for instance, <clears throat> they demonstrated that the soft shell clam, Mia aranaria, was reintroduced more or less uh, between 400 and 700 years ago in Atlantic Europe. So the species was present before, but was uh, um, was not present at that moment. So this is a, a reintroduction. And this uh, definitely must have had something to do with the increased movements of ships between Europe and, um, and the Americas. So there were lots of unwanted passengers uh, also on board of these ships. So if I say introduced, what does it actually mean? Introduced um, is a word that we also, we also use other type of words, exotic species, uh, alien species, species, non-native species. Uh, it's a species that is not native to a region and has arrived uh, with human existence. So that might be deliberate or accidental in the case of um, ship movements of Columbus. So when is a species native? It's native if it, uh, if it actually has involved in the region where it's present or elsewhere, but arrived by its own means. So usually uh, that happened a long time ago and in um, a way... Uh, um, this could have happened, for instance, is by um, um, is by uh, larval uh, dispersion. So bivalves, like uh, the, the clam I just talked about, they have uh, pelagic larvae, which even if they are sessile, which means that they're attached in one si in one site and they don't move during their adult life, they can move and uh, expand the range through the pelagic larvae, which are transported by the um, by the current. So a transport uh, like this is still uh, a species within its native range and to be introduced, it, um, there is actually a human uh, factor involved. So what is a vector? A vector is, um, um, is a means of transport by which a species is transferred to another location. And usually these are, this is um, hundreds or thousands of kilometers. And this can be uh, deliberate or, or not deliberate, unintentional or uh, uh, deliberate. So before Columbus, there were already a lot of this kind of factors. And uh, here I'm obviously talking about the wooden hull of ships. For instance, the Chinese in Asia and even the Vikings um, could have been able to transport marine organisms. And actually the uncertainty date of the on the introduction of the soft shell clam um, might also pinpoint at the Vikings at already um, a vector for introduction of this species. So, um, so like you can see on the, on the picture on the upper left-hand side here, this kind of transport would be by the wooden hull. Uh, and one of the very famous examples of this type of transport is also the shipworm 
which was a big danger for uh, um, because it can destroy the ships. And this is actually not a worm. It's a, even if the name is a ship worm, it's a bivalve and it's a wood boring bivalve. So um, in the more um, in the current area, we don't use wooden ships so much, but we can still have a lot of growth uh, of marine life on the hulls of ships, like you can see in the picture on the left hand side below. So that can be algae. Uh, that grow on the hull or on the helis of the of the ships, and this actually can slow down a ship a lot. So it, it, this does cost money to commercial um, shipping companies. So a way around this is using um, anti-fouling paint. Uh, so nothing can grow on the hull, but this is actually um, not very good for the environment. But not only growth on the hull can uh, be effective for transport, also the ballast water. So if ships, um, if commercial ships are full, they are much lower in the water. And if they unload their, um, their, their commercial um, uh, goods, then actually they are very high up in the water. So what a ship does, if it has to go empty between two harbors, is that it takes in ballast water. So it, it, it's a little bit lower in the, in the water column and it releases this ballast water on upon arriving to another harbor. And with this ballast water, pelagic larvae, uh, I just told you that the that bivalves have pelagic larvae for instance, but there are also um, organisms that spend their whole life in the water column, like uh, the comb jelly for instance, which is also a very famous introduced species. They can travel in this water and arrive to another harbor. So uh, due to the, the increase in maritime traffic that we have seen in, uh, in the last year, uh, because of increasing global chain, uh, trade, these factors, these um, transport roads and the possibilities for species to arrive from one side to another has all, have also um, increased. And um, we have also opened connections that weren't there before geographically, like for instance, the Suez Canal. And um, as you might remember, not so long ago, the Suez Canal was blocked by, um, by a ship and this caused a big disruption in um, global trade. So actually, um, Trade by ships is a very important um, uh, route and, and a very important factor. And what we can see in the future uh, when the, um, uh, with global warming is that there might be even new trade routes. So we're actually opening up new routes. For instance, if the Arctic would be ice free, this would be a very fast route between uh, sites that are now uh, much further apart. And um, what we have seen since the 19 um, 79 is that the, the extension of sea ice in the Arctic is, is going down, has decreased with a around 40%. So it is quite possible, even though I think at the moment there are some Russian ships st stuck in the Arctic ice. So uh, it's not a very um, trustworthy route at the moment, but it might be in the future. And this might also increase the ship movements uh, through new routes. So if we look at the connections between sites, we see that um, the world nowadays is very connected by marine uh, traffic. So this is an important factor for uh, marine organisms to be introduced to new sites, but not only um, by ships, they can be introduced. They can also be introduced by um, deliberate or maybe not so deliberate introductions, like for instance, aquaculture. The Japanese oyster was introduced in Europe be, um, uh, as a food source, a commercial food source, and they thought that it wouldn't be able to reproduce because the temperatures were too low. Uh, but not only did it reproduce, it actually colonized uh, the estuaries, like for instance in Holland, like you can see on this picture. Uh, and, it, and it's uh, a bit of a nuisance species at the moment. So that was a deliberate introduction that wasn't um, so deliberate in, in its uh, actual um, uh, final dispersion. There's also um, deliberate introduction of ornamental species, like for instance, the lionfish and um, uh, some algae for aquaria, like here the Calerpa taxifolia, who are not introduced to the marine habitat, maybe uh, deliberately, but are transported. And in the case of the ornamental alga, it, is, it uh, allegedly escaped from uh, the aquarium in Monaco and um, that way established in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. So when we look at the graph to the right-hand side, we can see that the number of introductions, the number of non-native species um, 
that are moved to another site has have increased markedly over the over the last years. And if we look at the importance, the relative importance of the uh, of the vectors, we can see that, for instance, on the left hand side, you can see the vectors of um, introduction of seaweeds worldwide. You can see that hull, fi hull fouling is a very important factor, as well as uh, shellfish farming and aquaculture and ballast water. But uh, that there's also a lot of unknown. So the biggest um, introduction, the, the biggest number of introductions, we actually don't know how the how the, how, how the seaweeds arrived at the new site. So if we look at the Mediterranean, which is, um, it, it's like a very small uh, sea. So it's very, uh, it's easier to, to study because of its limit, limited uh, uh, area. We can see that in the Mediterranean, the most important factor is the Canal of Suez, which is recently enlarged. So this is, will only um, increase in importance as well as uh, vessel movement, which is mar uh, marine traffic and aquaculture. Um, so when we stay at the Mediterranean, which I said is, is like, uh, since it's a limited geographic uh, area, it's um, easier to study processes. Sometimes it's like a model, a little model, see. So what we see in the Mediterranean, if we look at the, the number of introduced species, so more introduced species uh, would um, relate to a more red color, more warm color. So we see that most of the introduced species are actually very close to the Suez Canal. So um, if this is their entry points, that does make sense. But what we also see is that the, the, um, the origin uh, logically would be the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a tropical sea while the Mediterranean is temperate. So there's a big temperature difference between these two uh, regions. But if we look at the mean uh, surface temperature in the Mediterranean Sea, we also see that the warmest temperature can, temperatures can be observed in the southern part of the Mediterranean Sea. So not only is the southern part, the southern, southeastern part of the Medi Mediterranean uh, closer to the Suez Canal, it's also warmer. So the temperature in this area is closer to the temperature at the origin of the species. And is this important? Yes, it is important because um, a species would be more successful to settle in an area which is uh, resembles the, uh, the, um, the origin of the species. So what will we expect in the, what can we expect in the future? Here on the left-hand side in this graph, you can see that the temperatures of the, the surface water globally are increasing. And if you look at the right hand side, this is actually not, um, this is a, a figure in which you can see the, the rate of increase. So we what we see is that um, uh, the sea surface water has been warming in the Mediterranean, but it hasn't been warming uh, homogeneously. So it has the, the rate of warming is much faster in the southeastern part than in the northwestern part. So this means that this um, area wasn't only warmer, uh, warmer already, it will be even warmer than uh, the other part of the Mediterranean. So the regional differences. So um, this, uh, in, this introduced species, to remind you again, introduced species is uh, a species that is um, not native to a region and has arrived with human assistance, while a native species um, can arrive to a region um, through a range expansion, which is um, uh, uh, like natural transport. So the problem here is this, um, in definitions, the global warming is it uh, if a native species expands uh, its range because um, be because the site is warm enough for it. While it wasn't before, is this still uh, a native species, or are we actually talking about an introduced species here? So um, I've been talking about ranges. A range uh, is the geographical area in which the species can be found. So a range expansion is. Um, is an increment in this in the area where a species can um, can live can establish, and and why uh, why can a species establish in certain areas and not in others? Because uh, every species has a niche, and a niche is uh, the match of the species demands to a specific environmental condition. So, for instance, if a tropical species needs warm water while uh, an arctic species needs a much colder temperature so they have different niches 
Um, not only temperature uh, determines where species can live, also, for instance, humidity, oxygen availability, light, salinity, um, density of the water. Uh, and here we can think about uh, the deep sea and uh, pH. So as an example of a niche um, and the difference between theoretical demands of a species and actual realized niches, here we see an example of uh, barnacles. So here are two species of barnacles. And in the right hand side, you can see that their fundamental niche, so the place where they could live, has a big overlap. And then the realized niche um, is actually different because of a competition between these species. So this is also important. If a new species arrives uh, that has the same niche as a native species, it can it might be able to outcompete the other species. And, um, uh, and that might be a problem. So um, uh, do we expect to see a lot of rain shift? Yes, because of global warming, uh, the temperature, the global temperature is um, uh, is rising. So that also means that the species, even if it stays at the same place that where it always was, it will experience different environmental uh, um, uh, parameters and therefore it might have to move to stay within its niche. So um, why is this a challenge? Well, for instance, this is a challenge if we talk about the species that is present in a mountain, because uh, since at higher altitudes, the temperatures are cooler. So you could say, why doesn't the, the species just move up? So that means that the higher uh, niche, so on the top of the mountain, the species won't have a place to go to. And also the oxygen availability decreases when you go up. So it isn't only... Um, uh, the temperature that will be um, uh, in th the right condition for the animal, it might be that the, an other environmental parameter like oxygen is not. So the same for the deep sea. Um, even if the surface warms up in the deep sea, it might still be uh, the right temperature for a species, but uh, migrating to a deeper site means also having to deal with the pressure at that, at that site. And for instance, um, in the sea, in, in a marine environment, for instance, a species might be able to move from a lower let, uh, from a lower latitude to a higher latitude, but even if the if this dispersal is possible, um, the light availability at higher latitudes is not the same because uh, in summer there's more light available, but in winter there is less availability of light, and ocean acidification, uh, which Jack will talk about, also increases at higher latitudes. So it might be that this is not an option for those species. Um, and here we can see a possibility of a climate-induced rain shift for this kelp, Laminaria. Um, since the temperatures will warm up, it might be that the lower, the southern range of the species is not, um, these sites won't be uh, suitable anymore because the temperatures will be too high and it can move into higher latitudes. So this is what we, um, what we can expect. Um, but not for the Mediterranean because it has a geographical boundary. So in the end, um, for species in these changing times, um, it's um, usually not the strongest of the species that survive, uh, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. So this is, this is, I think, a clue for the, for for not only for species but also for us uh, humans. So. Um, uh, that is it. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to hear from Jack. Thank you, Iris, and thank you so much for keeping to time. This is a really nice overview of the topics that we want to go through today. And as you anticipated, Jack is going to talk more about ocean acidification and what we need to be doing. So let me give the floor to him directly so that he can start his presentation. Good afternoon. Good evening, all. Um, I'm now first going to... Uh, share my screen and I hope I have the right one right now. Is this the right one? Perfect. Okay, thank you. So tonight I'm going to, um, to focus on uh, carbon in the ocean. So basically the idea that I will speak about uh, what does the ocean provide as a service to us, which is not directly biology, but more physics and chemistry. Um, I'm not going to talk about physics, but just one Example, if you look at global warming, more than 95% of all the heat is going into the ocean. If that would not be the case, 
the, the winter temperature in London would be like the summer temperature in Sibiya. So um, our world would be inhabitable hot without the ocean taking all the additional heat. So um, the second surface of the ocean is that the ocean takes up a lot of the carbon dioxide which we emit and I'm going to uh, uh, communicate to you um, say the global carbon cycle and the role of the ocean and how that uh, causes acidification of the ocean. So um, before that I, um, I want to introduce two visionary scientists. First at the end of the 19th century a um, world famous chemist from Sweden, Svante Arrhenius, he already published in 1896 on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature on the ground. So basically, the uh, potential impact of uh, gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on the temperature is already known for more than 125 years. Then, um, in 1956, that was the International Geophysical Year, like we now have the, uh, the decade of the ocean. This is, was at that time the International Geophysical Year. There were two scientists in, in the US, Roger Revelle and Hans Seuss. They, um, they wrote an article where they basically said, okay, there is an increase in, um, in the atmospheric CO2 because of uh, fossil fuel release, which we believe is very small at present, but it may become significant during the future decades and may cause additional warming of our climate. So um, what they did is they hired a young PhD student, Charles Keeling, which you see there, which, which was um, this person. Um, he, uh, he got charged by doing something which uh, at that time were people thought that's not possible. Measuring the accumulation of fossil fuel derived carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So he started, uh, say, in the geophysical year, at the end is in 57. And then after two, three years, he already saw that the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, and these are numbers are 311 to 313 about, that means uh, 300 300 molecules out of the one million molecules are CO2. He saw that there was an increase. Now, this stimulated lots of research. And now we have, uh, at many places on the world, we have a systematic measurement of the carbon dioxide, like here at the station uh, Mauna Loa, Hawaii, with the years, and you see a steady increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which ultimately is the cause of global warming and also of um, of uh, changes in the ocean chemistry. So um, before I'm going to uh, to show some data, just uh, um, something about the units. In global change research, we always talk about one petagram or one gigaton, which is exactly the same. That's 10 to the power 15 grams. So most people don't have no feeling at all with 10 to the power 15 grams. That's uh, about all the fishes which are presently in the ocean gives you some idea about how much that is. It is about 25% of all the food, food we as humans are consuming. And it is about 10% of all our carbon emission, as you will see in the next sheet. So uh, to go more to, uh, to which might be more sensible for you is uh, how many Olympic swimming pools would fit in one petagram, and an Olympic swimming pool is quite is 50 uh, meters. It's about 400,000 Olympic swimming pools. That's one kiloton if you put it into uh, grams of water. So that's a very large amount. And then um, what is the problem with our present day carbon cycle? So for the last decade, we have seen that um, there are two sources of additional carbon, carbon to the atmosphere. One is uh, land use change. We are um, cutting trees so that we can um, uh, put a, a soya cultivation, which we can then uh, import for to, uh, to feed our livestock in, uh, in North America and Europe and other places. 
which is releasing about 1.6 petagram carbon per year. This deforestation, uh, the changes in the carbon stock related to it. By far the major source of anthropogenic carbon dioxide is fossil fuel release, and there is a little contribution of uh, lime uh, production, cement production. Now, so this is about 11 petagram carbon per year. So 11 times 400,000 swimming, Olympic swimming pools per year out of carbon we are emitting to the atmosphere. What is happening with it? Now, uh, about 47% is staying in the atmosphere. That's what the picture I showed that the increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, are measured and they are steadily increasing. That's 47% of what we as human add to the atmosphere. The other 53 is going to the land, to the land biosphere, so to all the forest and the ocean in similar quantities. The absolute amount and the relative amount varies a little bit, but usually we say that similar amount goes to the land biosphere and to the ocean. So why is the land biosphere taking up more CO2? That's because of, um, uh, say, greenhouse effects. Not the greenhouse effect in warming, but um, Plants and trees, they use carbon dioxide as a substrate for to produce new leaves, new, uh, new stems. And if you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, they grow faster, provided other things are there. Um, I'm going to focus on this part, uh, the ocean. So the oceans uh, not only take up 95% and more of the heat, but also 25% of the carbon which we as humans are emitting. So um, um, if you look at it, so 47% of the human carbon remains in the atmosphere, uh, about 25 goes into the ocean. So far, everything which we have emitted from the, from the very beginning as humankind, uh, 31 has accumulated in the ocean. And of course, uh, there are no free lunches, neither in, uh, in earth system science. So um, the ocean takes up this additional carbon dioxide but it comes at a price and that's ocean acidification. And we call ocean acidification the other CO2 problem. The first CO2 problem is of course global warming. The other CO2 problem is ocean acidification. Um, just for your imagination, the ocean contain about uh, 44 times more carbon than there is in the atmosphere. So the ocean carbon is really, really important. So why is there so much carbon in the ocean? Now, the first thing is, of course, that the ocean is, uh, has a very large surface area and is very deep. So you can, uh, you can easily take up a little bit out of the atmosphere and it doesn't change the ocean a lot. But uh, the other reason is the following. Um, CO2, this is, uh, this is, this is the, the sea air interface, this is the air. There is CO2 in the atmosphere, which goes into the ocean. And in the ocean, this CO2, which we as chemists write as uh, with a CO with a subscript, reacts with water. You form carbonic acid. So what is basically the, uh, the water, which you can also order in a restaurant if you, uh, if you want to have water with CO2. And this is a weak acid. And this weak acid, uh, you might recall from chemistry, is, is something uh, which wants to uh, get rid of its proton and then you get an anion and the bicarbonate, a weak acid, a weak base as, um, as the, uh, the other ion. So um, what is then the case? What we have is that carbon dioxide, a gas enters the waters. It forms an, a weak acid, which then results in the liberation of protons, which is uh, an acid generating substance and uh, bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate and carbonate, which are anions. So, and those anions cannot leave the seawater anymore. With the net effect that uh, of the 20 molecules of CO2 entering seawater, 19 are trapped in the form of those ions. And there is also some proton release. The, so the protons accumulate in the ocean and that's what we call ocean acidification. So, um, as a scientist, um, you, um, you have various tools to 
to understand nature. One of them is to, to make observations. Another one is to develop theory and uh, use that theory to make predictions. And um, one of the well-established uh, fields in science is thermodynamics, which is at the interface of physics and chemistry. And um, those, uh, this thermodynamics has been used to make prediction about uh, what would be the evolution of pH and the increase in carbon in the ocean given the atmospheric CO2 increase. Now, what, what we have done as oceanographers, we have measured at, um, at the ocean time series station. So at the multiple places at the ocean, like uh, Hawaii ocean time series stations, Bermuda Atlantic time series station, then we have Estop, which is the Spanish station, and then the Iceland Sea station. We have measured the pH in red and the uh, accumulation of carbon dioxide in blue. And you can see that precisely what we predict theoretically is observed that the pH, which is the acidity, is uh, acidity is increasing or the pH is declining. So we, we see that observations are fully consistent with theory, which has been developed a century ago. So that means that this is solid research. So um, here we have some more stations which you find in the ocean. And you can see there is one Spanish station that's on the, uh, the Canary Islands that's called Estoc. And that's one of the long-term observation stations that was started by Spanish scientists. And it is now one of the European um, long-term observation stadiums. Uh, so what is a pH um, for those who uh, might recall it from high school? That is the minus logarithm out of the proton concentration. Um, the, for the rest, it is important. There's a measure of acidity. The lower, the more acid it is. But do realize the ocean is still alkaline. The pH is about eight, so it is not acid. And also do realize a logarithm unit means that if you have a 0.3 unit change, it means a doubling of the protons. So, um, so acidification, so what? Why should we be interested? I'm going just to show uh, three impacts of ocean acidification. Um, many organisms in the ocean produce calcium carbonate, skeletons, frames, etc. Um, we have uh, tropical corals, we have deep sea water corals. The, the relative distribution is very similar in the ocean. This is what we all know. This has been discovered the last 25 years. And of course, you have different bivalves, including the, the, the cockles, uh, which, uh, which I guess most of you are familiar with from uh, the nice dishes you have in Spain. So. Um, one of the big issues is with uh, ocean acidification is that calcification declines. So here we have different calcifying group, calcifying algae, corals, coccolites, which are um, small plants, algae, which float into the water, which produce calcium carbonate skeleton, and eventually they can produce lots of carbonates, which are basically the cliffs of Dover are made out of this uh, carbonate from those little tiny organisms. And then you also have the mollusk. Um, what people have done is they have done lots of studies and uh, then they looked at the overall effect of all those studies. Um, we call it the methane analysis, which is coming out of medical sciences. And basically, if something is wet or pinkish, it means that um, the, um, it has a negative impact. So ocean acidification certainly has a negative impact of many aspects of calcifiers. Of course, there are always winners and losers. So Ocean acidification is, um, if you're looking at uh, fleshly algae, sea grasses, or diatoms, which are one of the group of phytoplankton in the ocean, you see that they profit from it because they are green. And that's logical. That's the same as what you see in the, in the forest on land. If you have more carbon dioxide available, those plants will grow faster. Um, but there are many, many more effects of ocean acidification, too many to discuss and, and communicate to you. Uh, but one which, um, which is quite esoteric might be interesting and you might recall even more than the other things is that um, ocean acidification, um, for what you can see here, the change in pH and we expect that um, depending on how we are uh, following the Paris Agreement or not, we will get a pH decline at the end of the century from minus 0.2 to minus 0.6. And uh, here we have the frequency 
of uh, of sound, and um, the, those those lines give the amount of attenuation, how much the attenuation is less in the ocean. And you see that if we get a pH decline of about 0.4, or we see that about uh, uh, we lose about 50% uh, of the attenuation of sound, meaning that the ocean is getting more noisier. Now, at this low frequency, that's the that's the sound, so that's the frequency where that is used for communication among mammals. So it means that um, those organisms are going to get in completely different uh, environments in terms of the, the sounds they can hear. So, um, so uh, a picture can, uh, can tell uh, it much better than uh, for many of us uh, than a scientific graph. So I show the effect of uh, carbon dioxide on two ecosystems, a Mediterranean ecosystem and a tropical uh, coral reef. At some places on uh, at the seafloor, we have seeps. Those are very localized places, by the way. You have seeps, which are where you have escape of CO2 rich uh, uh, gases and water, which are coming ultimately from, from vulcanism. And nearby, you have normal conditions. So in the Mediterranean, we see here the normal uh, Mediterranean with uh, nice sea grasses, some, uh, some shells. And here we see very nearby, there, were, there was a localized CO2 release. And you see that uh, this is uh, detrimental for the, for the shells, but the sea grasses are doing well. The same thing if you're going to look at this tropical uh, coral reef system, there were also carbon dioxide rich sheeps. And you see that at a pH of 8.1, which is the normal, you have a very nice uh, coral reef where we really, really would like to dive and snorkel. But if the pH is going down to levels what we expect by the end of this century, it doesn't look very well. Now, um, to be uh, to be really blunt, um, this is not the biggest um, problem with coral reefs, the CO2. I think the biggest problem is, is, is the, are the marine heat waves, which are causing that uh, they get a temperature shock and their symbionts will die. Okay, so then, um, we as scientists should not only look at uh, issues, identify issues, we should also think about, can we do something about it? Yes, there are a few things that we can do about it. Um, so, which we call ocean solutions. One of them is to, um, to add uh, either some uh, finely grinded uh, basalt rocks, olivin, or we add some lime which we can do either we can directly add it to the sea or we can add it uh, to our agricultural soil. And then it is uh, some of the products are transported to the sea. And then we increase the alkalinity, which is an, uh, basically a um, uh, scientific word for the amount of base. And then uh, we counter effect uh, ocean acidification. And even more important, we are going to enhance the uptake of CO2 by the ocean. Is this the only solution, the, there is a whole booming area of climate solution, including ocean solutions where scientists try to use all their knowledge and creativity to, um, to find ways to uh, contribute to the, uh, say, uh, to the uh, diminishing of carbon dioxide uh, issues. Uh, one way to do this, and that's something which we really have to go to if you want to uh, reach to 1.5 and 2 degrees warming targets is to go for what we call carbon dioxide removal options or negative emissions. And those always include that you take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then store it somewhere permanently. Now there are uh, a few options. Um, one of them is the coastal blue carbon, that's this one, which basically means that um, we're going to uh, stimulate the growth of sea cross meadows, mangroves, salt marshes, because they uh, capture a lot of carbon, carbon, and uh, they also have a lot of additional benefits like uh, nature conservation, coastal defense, etc. And you see that this is a really a very good climate solution, not only for the climate but for lots of other things. Uh, by the way, these are all the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, so there are no negative impacts. But the amount of carbon 
which we can capture with those coastal, what we call blue carbon system is very, very limited because the coastline is only a very small part of the ocean and of our globe. The other way to do this is to do uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement, which I was just showing in the previous graph. Uh, that's something which is being, has been tested in models in the lab, a few field experiments, but basically what we see here, it has no negative things, but we simply do not know whether there are benefits or not. So with this, I would like to end my uh, contribution to, uh, to today's uh, presentation. And um, I would like to give the floor back to Jara for, uh, for the discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jack. And again, thank you for keeping to time. This is really impressive. Economists would have never done this. Um, so I hand it over to you. You've both been great at this. So we have no questions in the chat and I have about an encyclopedia full of questions for you and Iris. So I'm going to get us started. But I invite everyone else to use the chat so that they can ask questions as well. And I'm going to get us started on a provocatory note because COP26 is just over and you had to see this coming from an economist, I guess. Uh, you know, we, we've seen the health of our ocean being a key to the sustainable development goals that the UN is facing. And we see politicians more and more saying that the ocean economy is a very important part of our economy. In fact, the OECD has an ocean economy page uh, really brilliant data on the presence of fish and, you know, how many ships are in the sea and what are we fishing? What are we doing with it? And we know that there's some efforts on species restoration, uh, on coral reefs restoration as well. Uh, some of it going on in Australia with the Great Barrier Reef. Are we doing enough? Are we heading in the right direction? Or is there still a very large gap between where we are, where we're heading, but mostly where we should be going? Yeah. You wish you start? Um, yes, I'll start. You can finish because I'm sure you have a lot of a lot to say about this. So um, I think it's important not to be negative because uh, if you're negative and you say it's too late, we're not doing enough, um, that doesn't actually stimulate people to, to really put in an effort. I think it's never too late to do something. Um, are we doing enough at the moment? I, I'd say no really but um, um yeah one of the problems i think is that that um we're not using the possibilities that that are offered enough and there's this uh, lag in in knowledge and, and in implementation and I, I think jack has more profound things to say as well yeah okay yes so um uh, are we doing enough no because uh, there is a pressing problem um, should we be pessimistic? No, because um, um, because of the, uh, the pressure from society um, and the recognition that we, um, we only have about 11, 12 years to go till we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have really passed the 1.5, if we continue like this, um, uh, we are realizing that we have to go uh, towards um, carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere and um, the ocean plays a major role. Um, we can do it with nature-based solutions, which I was showing, but probably one of the major roles is that um, the ocean offers lots of space for uh, solar and uh, wind energy, which, uh, which means that we have to rely less on uh, fossil fuel. Um, and also if any of the carbon capture technology, which we have to include if we want to go to carbon neutral, say 2040, 2050, we have to develop technologies to capture carbon dioxide and to store it somewhere. And uh, the, the place to store one of the option is of course in all the old reservoir for gas and oil, which, uh, which, which the technology is there. The energy companies formerly called oil and gas companies have, have the technology, have the infrastructure, etc. cetera. Um, there is of course the human dimension that um, it will likely not happen a lot on land because in many of the countries, certainly in Europe, most of the countries will 
the people will oppose that uh, CO2 will be stored below ground on land, but we can do it at sea. So um, um, there is a lot of positive energy. It's creating a lot of um, uh, new players are coming on the market. For instance, uh, just a few months ago, I saw uh, that uh, uh, Google has now a uh, carbon uh, modeling group in the ocean because they want to explore what are the possibilities because those all the everybody sees that there is a pressing need that we do something about it and uh, and um, also you see that um, natural scientists which used to be um, what what some people call an ivory tower and don't looking at the, all the other aspects we from the very beginning you see now consortia um, where law people, economic people, ethics people, everybody's involved to look for climate solutions which are acceptable for everywhere and by everybody so that we can really go for solutions. So I'm optimistic, but we have to do something. That's great. So we have the first set of questions from the audience. I'm going to read them out to you. And I think most of them are actually to both of you. Yeah. Um, so let's start with the first, thinking about lime added to the sea to change the pH of it. Is this dependent on the depth and the temperature of the places where we're adding it or what is it dependent on? Okay, so um, the figures I showed, um, the, there were those, um, um, you saw that the pH was going down with, with, with some um, fluctuations. Those fluctuations are there because if you, measure at a certain location in the ocean, the currents are changing, the, there is the weather pattern, the seasonality is always different, so you see those things. And uh, the lines was just uh, a statistical technique called linear regression, which gives the long-term trend. Great, so let's maybe take a couple more questions. Uh, Professor Rodriguez Posa is asking to Jack, but also to Iris. Jack mentioned that global warming and ocean acidification are the twin challenges linked to increased CO2 emissions. Are they complementary? Do they reinforce each other? Okay, that's probably one for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. but, uh, so the um, uh, global warming and, uh, and the CO2, they, uh, they both have uh, the impact on the ocean. And they have, uh, they have uh, for instance, if you get global warming, you're changing the circulation pattern in the ocean. And for that reason, you also change the carbon dioxide uptake by the ocean. If you have warming of seawater, you change the carbon chemistry of the ocean. Basically, if you, uh, if you make it warmer, you, uh, you, uh, you change the solubility of CO2 in the ocean, which again has consequences for the carbon dioxide uptake. So those two things, are interacting, which also makes it very complex. And then I'm not talking at all about the biological effects, which the living organisms are affected both by temperature and CO2. And that's another story again. So that's why it is not easy to do this type of research. All right, let's proceed to the next question. And I think Iris this time <laughs> can yeah. be on you. So Antonio tells us, I have read that we have impacted negatively the size spectrum of species in the sea. How do we think that recovery of these could help in general to the healing of our oceans? So the, um, the decrease in size in the species in the sea is, is mainly due to, when we talk about fish populations, for instance, is, is due to fishery and, and over-exploitation of these uh, resources. So uh, how can we help recovery? Fishing less, I would say in this case, um, uh, they, would, they would be really important also because bigger individuals uh, are more re, um, have a higher re reproductive capacity. Uh, so that would be a positive feedback. Um, so, um, so this is a problem we should fish less. So what all the, are the alternatives? Because aquaculture is also uh, sometimes not always very good for the for the environment so um, it I think it's time to to think about alternatives and maybe uh, take a step uh, a step back in there um, aquaculture I think most of the fish that that I see in the market is aquaculture now it's not actually caught in the Mediterranean because it's so over uh, exploited so Jack do you have something to add do you have an opinion no, 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 no. I've nothing to add to this. this is, uh, I agree. 
Okay, so we are moving direction now uh, and thinking about actions and what we can do. So Sandra is asking us, how much can individuals do about the problems that we've highlighted? And how much is it about corporations and policymakers? And if individual can play a key role, how do we do this and how do we increase awareness? And that's a really good question for you too, because you've been engaged with the news as well and you're actually increasing awareness yourself over these problems. Yeah. yeah so um, I, I've been talking about this with, with some people because it's really frustrating. I feel the frustration myself as well as an individual. It's very difficult to... Um, to contribute, for instance, I'm not <laughs> I'm not able to buy an electrical car because of economical limitations, and and I'm living in a first world country, and I don't have a lot of financial problems. So, um, it's sometimes it's hard to see as an individual how you can contribute, and and it's easy to say that um, uh, that maybe the res the responsibles are the the, the politicians, but also we do vote the politicians and we have some um, ways of pressuring them um, in, into certain actions. And I think that if we can really erase, raise the awareness of this problem and, and raise it <clears throat> to a population level and, and put the right pressure on, the, on our politicians to uh, promote um, sustainable energy, for instance, we can do a lot as individuals. So uh, I think that is, that is really important. And also politicians are individuals as well. Um, everybody has to uh, chip in. Jack, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah. so there is, um, there is something you can do as an individual. As a scientist, individual scientist, you, you can also contribute. You, um, you can uh, communicate it to your students. You can communicate it to the general public. You, um, um, but you always have to, um, to make a trade-off between... Um, um, are you going to do just doing the science or are you going to be an activist? So I've decided not to be an activist. I'm, uh, but some colleagues are much more active in the political arena. I will never do this. I will always remain uh, an academic. I want to, if, if the answer is uh, which something which is, um, uh, which, which is uncomfortable, I will also mention it. But uh, that's, that's something which I do as a scientist, as a person being, yes, um, that's the same thing as you, uh, which is for all of us, um, our daily decisions do matter if we do it all of us. But it is very difficult because sometimes you really have to make sacrifices and, uh, and, um, and everybody makes different choices eh, in the ways and, and things are not easy. If you have a car, should you, uh, which is six, seven years old, should you keep it? Till it is 15, 20 years old, or should you buy a Tesla if you uh, if you can? Afford if you have it? the money for it, if you have a yeah, Tesla, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you no. Know, but, uh, but but even then, it, it is uh, if you do a life cycle analysis, those questions are not that simple. Of course, it, if you would um, if you really would make a, a good impression to the outside world, buy a Tesla or another elect electric car, and uh, you everybody thinks this person is doing well for him for the environment, but as long as we produce our electricity mainly by fossil fuels and you are leaving something, an old car, which was functioning well and you have to make a new one, if you do the life cycle analysis, you better use your old car for years to come. So those things are very difficult and we have to communicate it and the people have to be informed about it. But, um, and uh, yeah. Um, just communicate to everybody what is going on with real effects and uh, so that people are not getting emotional and really look at what's happening and what, what we can do about it. And also be realistic. Don't, um, don't feel guilty all the time for not being able to, you're always able to do something. Yeah, I think you're, you're touching on a very important topic that, that we're studying more in behavioral sciences, behavioral economics as well, which is climate guilt. Uh, big driver of actions, but also sometimes it makes it feel so overwhelming that maybe we stop doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, but Iris, we have another question for you. So you highlighted the rise in sea temperatures as having an important impact on the composition of the sea species. What are the potential implications beyond the ocean? So for example, in terms of global warming, but also in terms of the economic and social changes that will follow. So I'm not such an expert in economic and social changes, but um, I can talk a little bit about um, 
the 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 changes in, in caused by the temperature. So uh, in this in this talk, I I talk mainly about um, the the changes in in distributions of species, but it's not only distribution of species. A change in temperature also uh, causes a change in 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 respiration. So um, when when the temperature is higher, uh, for instance, in in autotrophic systems like uh, plants, like for instance, in seagrasses. So um, since they're plants, they photosynthesize and they, they produce oxygen. But also at night when there's no light, they uh, respire like us. So with increasing temperatures, this, this balance um, changes a little bit. The respiration usually goes up much faster with uh, increasing temperatures than the, than the oxygen production. So this would um, change the oxygenation of the, of the oceans. And, um, and, and this is also a very uh, negative effect of, of global warming. Um, um, and as an implication beyond the ocean, I think if our oceans aren't healthy, uh, planet Earth will have a hard time of, of staying healthy as well. So um, when we have, for instance, less oxygen in the ocean, this could also be um, bad for shellfish production and other commercial species. So it, it, it's kind of, um, of, a, of a chain of negative effects, um, I would say. Great. So, Jack, I'm afraid you're going to have to be a politician for a day for the next couple of questions. Yeah, I saw, I saw them. Yeah. <laughs> if you both had the power to make something happen, which actions would you promote and which actions would you discourage? Okay. So, uh, I would, um, uh, I never thought about those things because I don't like, uh, I'm happy with our democratic, sometimes chaotic societies. <laughs> uh, but uh, a few things we could do. We could uh, stop uh, supporting uh, uh, the classical fossil fuel industry by subsidies. We can stop that. Just that's, it will be a hard time for them and also for many people economically depending on it, but it will uh, if we uh, waste the cost of, uh, of gas and oil, we will get a more rapid shift. That's that's one thing I would, uh, I, if I would be a dictator, I would do. Uh, but also would also clearly communicate that um, uh, any change will uh, imply that we uh, we have to make some choices which people don't like. If we um, if we want to have solar power and wind energy, which means we have to to change the landscape, the cityscape, like uh, solar panels on uh, on old monument. Do we want this? That's an something, uh, the same thing at sea. Eh? If, we, uh, if we put the whole North Sea full with uh, windmills, we cannot eat any more the fish from the North Sea because there is no space for them. So the, all those things, uh, we have, you have to communicate that clearly and that's not happening. And uh, so that's, uh, that's another thing. And we should also realize that if we're going to uh, solar energy, etc., we need a lot of, um, of um, special metals like the rare earth element, uh, the cobalt, the lithium, which are sometimes coming from countries which have a political system which we are not in favor of. That's another thing which I would communicate. And uh, but but if I would if I would be in power, I would really raise the uh, the taxes on CO two and stop putting and subsidizing um, um, innovations which really lead to. Uh, 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 climate adaptation, mitigation, and carbon dioxide removal, because the, it is important that we do something. Yes, I, I wouldn't like to be the dictator and feel the responsibility of, of like, like uh, Jack says, because there are always negative sides to every every choice and, and it, it is not going to be easy. And I don't think there is a right way. There are several paths we can take, but every, positive effect will, will also have some negative uh, effects. Like for instance, the, the windmills um, and collisions with birds, uh, sea life, um, every, every positive um, uh, sustainable energy has, has kind of negative effects as well. And, and then there's the, the problem with the metals, but we'll have to make those choices at some point. And, and I do agree that, um, that the change should be much faster and, and maybe, um, not encouraging fossil fuels would definitely be a way uh, and, and maybe find some, uh, also promote research into alternatives 
for uh, fossil fuels, fuels maybe we haven't thought of uh, at this moment. But uh, it's going to be hard, yes. And then something that you would discourage, Iris, if you have anything. <laughs> Which I would discourage. Uh... Cheap flight. <laughs> yeah, that's basically yeah, but, if, if 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 you look at it, it is cheaper to yes. Uh, for, for but this is to, uh, easy to, for you to say who lives in the country where your family is. I I do feel the hurt. I agree with you, and I I. But it's hard. I live on an island in Mallorca, and for me to move, I have to use some kind of transport that does contaminate. And and this kind of choices, is is hard. Maybe you can say I'll skip the holidays. I'll just stay where I am, but. Um, certain type of movements are very um, hard to sacrifice, I think, <laughs> for a lot of people, including me. Yeah, we, we can stop them at higher levels. It's okay. <laughs> we, <laughs> we can get a few VIPs who are taking way more flights than you, I think, and, and discourage that. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and I don't fly when I go on holiday usually, but I have to take the boat to go off to get off the island. So no way around that. So one thing that, that came to mind as we were talking about individual actions, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion over changing diets uh, and a lot of it revolves around being vegan. But part of the research is highlighting that we are going to have so much more seaweed in the future that potentially that's a way forward as well. Do you know anything about the research around this? So... Um... Seaweed potentially could use the increase in, in uh, carbon dioxide to grow. Uh, and it's not actually counted in the blue carbon uh, and the carbon offset schemes because it doesn't store carbon because uh, it usually grows on rocks or, or is very easily um, uh, uh, decomposed. So eating seaweed might be um, an option, but um, we, still, we would still generate... Um, uh, waste as well by eating seaweed. So uh, I'm actually not an expert, but it's an interesting thought that this might be a, um, a kind of a solution. Very interesting. Okay, I'm going to go on with some of my questions as we wait for the floor. Uh, one important part which has been discussed both in policy making and in research and that we haven't quite touched upon is plastics and microplastics and the role of that on the ocean. Do we think that there's enough technology out there to reduce the importance of this? You know, there's many brands now that produce with partially recycled plastics and it seems like we might be moving in a better direction. The US recently banned single-use plastics in a number of cases, um, but a lot of it still remains in other forms. Yeah, no, plastic, yeah. Plastics is... Um... Plastics has received a lot of attention the last 10, 10 years in um, marine plastics. Um, um, there are some people which really think it is a big issue. Some others think it is not such a big issue in terms of the science, I mean, scientifically. Um, you should realize that uh, the, um, a lot of the, uh, the plastics enter enter really in the coastal domain and remains in the coastal domain. And uh, there are pictures which really, uh, iconic pictures which you see, but that's, those are not really representative for what's happening. The, the way to solve it is really at uh, where it starts. Uh, we should recycle the plastics and then we can do a much better job. Eh? So we, um, and just, um, I'm living in the Netherlands, but we, um, we, we, we separate plastics, not everywhere, because also some of the uh, processing uh, companies, they separate it. But um, when I was in Princeton three years ago, there were really the different types of plastic you had to put in different containers. And that's the way to go for it, because there are so many different types of plastics. And if you put them all together, you cannot reuse them. Then you're making, uh, you get a good feeling that you separate your plastics, but it has no use. And that's something which we can do a much better job, certainly in my country, but in, I think in most European countries, because you don't even see it in countries like Austria and Germany, where you have to separate into three or four different types of uh, plastics, which, which should happen. And that's something which is, uh, which is something which is easily implemented, just if the political will, Mr. Is, it, it is doable. Just, uh, and the individual commitment as well. 
Yeah, that's of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one final question. Actually, I'm going to mix two because one I think is really hard and one is really easy. Uh, and then we can close the debate for today. So we talked about the oceans in the last 500 years. Um, I'm not going to ask you a forecast for the next 500. That seems too hard, but let's say for the next 50. That's hard enough, but let, let's think about a good scenario. I agree with Iris and I agree with this talk that there's a lot going on and we should be hopeful. Uh, what does the ocean look like in 50 years in an hopeful scenario? And on a simpler note, and, and we can close with that, what is the place that you will let your students or the audience Google that would make them hopeful and happy about the oceans? <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what always makes me happy is googling coral reefs but <laughs> hopeful <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit different so um i think it's important to see if if um if organisms and ecosystems will be able to adapt to the unprecedented rate of of uh, well mostly warming that they will see you will certainly see changes um um probably not always for the best, but maybe sometimes um, if, if an ecosystem is resilient enough and has the capacity to, to adapt, it might not be as, as bad as we think at this moment. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, as scientists, we, um, we use um, a reductionistic way of looking at problems and uh, for instance, if you want to look at long-term effects, we are doing short-term experiments. And those are often exaggerating the problem a little bit. Like, um, it is the, the speed, the rate at which uh, communities can adapt, which is really important. Like, uh, the problems with the coral reefs now have in Australia, if, we, if the coral reefs would instantaneously be transformed in coral reefs, which are always in the Red Sea, they could stand those heat waves because in the Red Sea, they have it always. So it, it is, um, the adaptation potential is there, but the speed is not fast enough for the organism. That's, um, and that's something um, which, uh, um, it used to be an, uh, a word which you was not allowed to say in conservation biology, but assistant evolution, which is now a booming field, which was, I think if you would have said that 10 years ago at a conservation biology conference, you would, uh, you would need some, uh, some assistance to leave the room, I think. <laughs> but that's the, but the, so the, you, you can see it as a negative side that, it, uh, that we have to go to those tools, these type of approaches, but also the positive side that humankind wants to do something about it and might be able to do something about it. Um, um, with respect to um, a lot of the other things like sea level rise, uh, continued global warming, CO2 uptake of the ocean, it will continue. Some things will remain for a very long time. Any of the, any more, say, if, if we would emit today 100 units of CO2, eight or nine of those units will still be in the atmosphere in 100,000 years. So some of the things we can never turn away in thousands of years, and we have to accept that. And that's something, uh, it is illusionary to think that we can return to, uh, to conditions which were there before we were uh, perturbing the environment. So um, uh, that's, uh, so that's going the, the how would, I think the ocean will look very similar, except for the coastal domain where we will see a uh, uh, loss of certain communities, some new communities and a lot of uh, uh, human, uh, human use, much more than we do now. Right. We hope it's going to be more sustainable, though. <laughs> yes. Okay, I think we can close the talk. Thank you so much to both of you for your slide stacks, which are really, really informative, especially to people like me who love the ocean, but don't know nearly enough as what we're supposed to to help it. Thank you for the discussion to everyone who's asked questions, to Ignacio and to everyone who put together this wonderful event. Uh, I think all of it will be recorded, so you can watch it all over again if you want to. And I think we can close this up and just have a wonderful weekend. And, and you know, you're welcome to Google anything about the oceans, I think. <laughs> so thank you very much for this really nice discussion. I enjoyed it a lot.
Yeah, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed it as well.